The Egyptian economy was the only one in the Middle East North Africa region to avoid a recession in 2020, which is a good reflection of the economic roller coaster the country routinely finds itself on. One driven by inflation rates of up to 30%, a halving of its currency, and a painful IMF bailout in 2016. But how did it find itself in this situation? What impacts did five-year plans, spending nearly 20% of its GDP on the military, and widespread nationalisation have on its economy? Why is Egypt the world's largest importer of wheat? And perhaps most importantly, what has its post-2011 revolution delivered? For those watching this within an hour of upload, we'll be hosting a live discussion on the Alt Simplified Discord server, the link to which is in the description below. Now, to answer all of this, we first need to take a look at the country's history. How did Egypt's history shape its economy? In the aftermath of the Second World War, Egypt was a monarchy, but things would quickly change in 1952, when a coup by military officers established the modern republic. Up until then, the private sector had accounted for 97% of GDP, and a similar proportion of jobs, something which was going to change very quickly. You see, throughout its history, Egypt has often found itself a key regional player, given its substantial population and strategic location. At the core of this is the Suez Canal. Initially completed in 1869, it is the fastest way to sell from Europe to Asia, reducing the journey from London to Mumbai by 4,500 miles, or about 40%, arguably making it one of the world's greatest shortcuts. Importantly for our story, at the time of the revolution, it was owned and operated by the Suez Canal Company, whose major shareholders were no less than Britain and France. Yet, ownership of the megaproject, and in fact the whole economic structure of Egypt, would change through the delivery of another megaproject, the Aswan Dam. This was an ambitious project to finally control the unpredictable flow of the Nile River, which supplies a staggering 90% of Egypt's water with approximately 95% of the population living by its banks. Now, this crucial project was meant to be funded by the US, Britain and the World Bank. However, following the revolution, there were growing concerns over its government's Cold War allegiances, resulting in funding being pulled in 1956. And in response, Egypt decided to nationalise the Suez Canal. Using the valuable foreign currency revenue it generated to not only finance the new dam, but also team up with the Soviet Union, who built it. Playing one Cold War power off against another. As a side note, this didn't go unnoticed, leading to the Suez Canal crisis, an ultimately failed military invasion by Britain, France and Israel. But that's a different story altogether. The key point is that nationalising the canal was a crucial turning point for Egypt's economy after which the state really started to play a much larger role, establishing state-owned enterprises, an industrialization plan, and even widespread nationalization of foreign property. It was the industrialization plan though which proved to be fundamental. You see, the plan intended for the government to finance heavy industry with the private sector funding light industry. Yet the results were underwhelming. So, to help boost investment, the government developed an elaborate system of price controls, particularly for agriculture, using the system to take profits it would use to finance industrialization, as well as passing a series of laws forcing companies to buy government bonds. These laws were also non-negotiable, so when certain banks and institutions failed to deliver on government investment, they were nationalized, handing further control to the government. By the 1960s, the country for the first time in its history had developed its own 10-year economic plan, aiming to double GDP within a decade. Split between two five-year plans, the first period saw GDP rise by 30%. Pretty good, until you consider its low starting point and the anticipated 45% it was meant to achieve in the first five years. However, when it came to the second five-year plan, this ended up being largely sidelined due to conflict with Israel, essentially turning its economy into a wartime one. With hundreds of thousands of conscripts, military spending accounted for a staggering 17% of GDP in the early 70s, culminating in an economic model which was clearly unsustainable. The nation had to open up its economy or face financial oblivion, which to be fair, it did start to do in the late 70s through the so-called open door policy. The trouble though, was that open market policies were never truly embraced, a theme we'll see later on in the video. 
Realistically speaking, the economy of the time did, and to a degree still does, rely on four main sources of income. The first is oil revenues through its state-owned companies. The second, the development of its tourist sector, certainly not a pyramid scheme. The third being traffic flowing through the Suez Canal. And finally, remittances from Egyptians working abroad. But what about local businesses with global ambitions? Well, whilst open door policies existed on paper, the finances didn't always lend support. Exports were largely hampered by an overvalued currency, making international competitiveness even more difficult, a factor making a big appearance later on as well. Back in the 1970s, if you looked at the economic growth data, this was somewhat misleading. The devil was in the detail. Economic issues were reflected through its high level of international debts, balance of payments problems, and rising unemployment. So, in order to solve this, the government decided to change strategy. It resorted to old habits. Re-implementing five-year plans with a focus on those core income generating strategies we mentioned earlier. Unfortunately for the nation, this failed to remedy its underlying structural issues, abandoning them for a much more market-orientated approach during the 90s and 2000s. Yet it's important to stress how the economy's structural issues were never fully addressed in the process. Sure, over the decades, Egypt did make some progress, with the share of agriculture falling from 28% in 1974 to 11% today, and services rising to more than half of GDP though largely low-skilled ones, with the majority of the labour force working in the informal sector. In fairness though, industrialization did occur, but was dominated by the extraction of natural resources, as opposed to the much-prized heavy good industries, reflecting issues which all fueled 2011's revolution, leading us on to the next section. How did the Arab Spring impact the economy? Like many countries in the region, there were high hopes that 2011 would lead to a brighter economic future. Unfortunately, the political instability in the process dealt a huge blow to the tourist sector, a key source of foreign currency. Tourism wasn't the only sector to suffer. Foreign direct investment also collapsed. And whilst it did begin to recover, progress was slow. A common trend, as most economists have highlighted, the slow pace of economic reform representing factors which failed to improve the chronically high unemployment and rapidly rising costs of living, leading to a further change in government as the military took control. Though despite the change in government, Egypt's macroeconomic outlook continued to decline. For years, the country had run huge deficits to compensate for its underperformance. Poor results, partly driven by an overvalued currency, one the central bank had been defending through its ever-dwindling foreign currency reserves. By 2016, the country's debts had reached such unsustainable levels, it was forced to turn to the IMF for a $12 billion bailout. Raising an important question, what economic impact did Egypt's IMF bailout have? As is typical with IMF loans, this was conditional upon a series of structural reforms. Perhaps the greatest being the floating of its currency, which immediately declined by a shocking 50% overnight. Now, to be fair, this decline was in the official exchange rate. The majority of Egyptians had been using the unofficial black market one for a very long time, a product of a dire shortage of foreign currencies and heavy restrictions on their use way before. Such a significant decline, even in the official rate, had severe consequences. For example, the rate of inflation rose an eye-watering 30% the following year, with interest rates rising to almost 20% in response representing a huge blow to the cost of living. So why undertake the devaluation? Well, it helped increase exports and improve the nation's balance of payments, both fundamental to avoiding further bailout. Egypt's inflation is also looking a lot better compared to where it was just a few years ago, declining to its lowest level in more than a decade, as well as other macroeconomic indicators showing positive signs. Despite saying all of this, substantial issues remain. What are Egypt's main economic challenges? Even before its bailout, the country was struggling with high rates of poverty. An estimated quarter of the population live on less than $3.20 per day. Austerity cuts, particularly to food and fuel subsidies, have hit the poorest hardest. You see, for decades, Egypt has directly subsidized food. More than 60% of the population receive bread rations, in the form of something called baladi bread, 
at a fixed price which has been unchanged for decades, although the size of the bread has recently shrunk. In fact, Egyptians consume more bread per capita than anyone else in the world, at an estimated 180 to 210 kilograms per year, compared to the 60 to 70 kilogram global average, levels many people take to be a sign of financial distress, lacking a balanced diet. This is also linked to why Egypt is the largest importer of wheat in the world. To give you some context, the cost of bread and food ration cards is estimated to be more than 1.5% of GDP, with subsidies in general accounting for a quarter of government spending in recent years. However, a big strain on government spending has also been rising interest rates. Repayments on its debt equate to more than a third of government revenue, raising questions over whether Egypt has actually fallen into a classic debt trap, unable to ever earn enough to fully pay off its debts. In addition to this, the improvements seen in its foreign reserve currency levels have been criticised as being misleading. Whilst it's true they have increased, a large proportion of this is actually borrowed money, questioning how much of a benefit this really is. But perhaps its biggest challenge lies in its geography. Unlike microstates which are swimming in oil, Egypt has the largest population in the Arab world, almost entirely restricted to the banks of the River Nile, with 95% of the country living on 4% of the land, the remainder being largely desert. With a rapidly growing population, already crowded cities are continuing to expand. So, does Egypt have a plan? Well, yes. For all its economic problems, it's currently planning or building 20 new cities with the aim of housing 30 million people, including the new administrative capital, intending to house the new parliament and most government agencies. Its central business district will also be filled with skyscrapers, including the tallest building in Africa, Iconic Tower. To be honest, it's fair to say that the country is going through a construction boom, at least concerning skyscrapers. According to a 2019 Deloitte report, it had the highest number and value of construction projects of any African nation, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and attracting much needed investment. Though one mega project may also be its biggest economic threat, the Grand Renaissance Dam of Ethiopia is set to slow the flow of water through the Nile, as it fills a reservoir larger than the size of Greater London, posing a risk to Egypt's water security over the estimated four to seven years it will take to fill. On the other hand, the hydroelectricity generated is aiming to offset chronic power shortages in both Ethiopia and its upstream neighbours, presenting, if nothing else, just one other challenge Egypt will have to overcome if it is to ever truly thrive. So overall, we can't help but notice that Egypt has experimented with more than its fair share of economic policies, shifting from a private to a state-run development model in the 50s and 60s. Attempts to open its economy were often disjointed, resulting in an underwhelming performance. A common theme through all of this has been its macroeconomic instability, one which revolutions largely failed to address. Whilst the country's more recent performance has shown some positive improvement, deep structural flaws remain, including concerns over its governance and levels of corruption ranking 117th out of 180 countries on the Corruption Index, a sign of the significant issues the nation needs to address to unlock its true potential. And now, it's over to you. Do you think Egypt's economy shows promising signs? Has its IMF bailout set it on a better path? Can it continue to diversify its economy through large-scale mega-projects? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're watching this an hour after upload, then we'll be going live on the Discord server general discussion. Also, if you think we've earned it, consider leaving us a like and subscribing. And as always, see you in the next video.